Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambuddhasa Udang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So people can continue to meditate if they wish. That was a traditional homage or um, invitation for Dhamma talk, uh, beautifully done, and a homage to the Buddha, which is how we begin every talk in our tradition. So last two weekends ago, we had uh, Bhante Sudaso and Ayasoma visiting us from the East Coast, an empty cloud. And the retreat we did in a day long uh, down at Fauntleroy Church was called Jomo, the Joy of Missing Out. And it was themed around the four bases of clinging. So what in Pali we call upadana. And this concept of clinging is a fundamental one in the Buddhist worldview in the sense that the Buddha conceived how we relate to objects and views and the sense of self in the world as similar to how a flame feeds upon and clings to a piece of wood or a log on which it burns. So this agitated flame that consumes and is bound to its fuel is synonymous to how we take objects in our world or positions or concepts of who we are and we tie ourselves to them and we burn and consume them until both them and we are ash. We tie ourselves to that which is breakable and will decay and when it breaks our hearts break. One problem with this analogy is that it was given in the time or in the place of India, which is a very hot country. And the cooling of a fire meant something very different than it means to those of us coming from a culture that is plagued by cold winters where the dampening of a fire means death. And often when we think about the extinguishing of a fire, which is the term the Buddha used for awakening, nibbana, it was a colloquial term at the time. Um, it means cooling, the cooling of greed, hatred, and delusion. But it was a term people would use for simple things, like you'd put your soup out on the porch to nibbana, to cool. And one issue is that in the West, or in modernity, we think about a flame going out, and what replaces it is darkness and cold. But this is not the Buddhist conception. What replaces a flame gone out is light. And when Bhikkhu Bodhi translates Nibbana, that word, he in some ways speaks about how etymologically awakening is a better or more accurate term, but that he uses the term enlightenment instead because so many of the Buddhist analogies for awakening have to do with light arising. And the Buddha compared the awakened mind or the awakened heart to light that lands on nothing, pervading all space. And this is important because in some sense, we have no choice about existing in the world. The world is a realm of fragility, of decay, 
of growth, of change. And in that sense, there's always a sense of uh, dukkha, of suffering, it threaded through it. And as humans, we don't have a ne- we can't have a neutral stance towards suffering. Either we are turning towards it or running from it. And in that same way, turning towards it in the sense of comprehending it, of carefully understanding it, which is the second noble truth. In the same way, we don't have the choice to just exist in the world. There's an orientation always. Either we are feeding off the world like a flame feeds off and consumes and turns to ash that which is around it, or we are giving to and blessing the world like light blesses and warms all that it touches. So this is the essence of the Buddhist path, is we're exchanging a, a, an energy of fire and an orientation of consumption for the energy of light and the orientation of blessing and warming and spaciousness. And when the Buddha spoke about those things we cling to, that which we bind ourselves to and burn off of, he spoke about four locus or loci of identity or of clinging. So you have kama upadana, which is uh, clinging to, feeding off of, sensual desire. You have ditti upadana, which is clinging to views. You have sila pata paramasu padana. I might be getting the poly a little wrong on that, but it means clinging to rites and rituals or methods and practice. And the fourth and final base of clinging is clinging to self-view. So the concept we have of ourselves. And we can use this framework in a variety of ways. One is in a very simple context, and I've used this example before, of if uh, a situation comes up with which angers us, to parse out which of the bases of clinging is being challenged really can help soften uh, the anger and help you understand it more. So uh, the example we I use sometimes is if you're in a monastery and someone cuts in front of you, a younger monk for, and say, takes some food you wanted, um, are you angry because your attachment to sensuality, kama upadana, is being compromised where you really wanted that piece of cake? Is it that your attachment to views is being compromised in that, um, or challenged or invoked in that you might think, oh, this other monk's always like this, you know, he's just such a disrespectful person. Is it that your attachment to rites and rituals or methods and practices is being challenged or compromised in the sense that you might say, in the monastery, it's supposed to work this way, you know, I'm supposed to get the first uh, round of carrot cake, not this monk. Or is it your attachment to self-view that's being invoked and or challenged? So saying, no one respects me, it's always been like this ever since I was little, I'll never be worth anything. Um, And parsing out which of these bases of clinging is being agitated and burning can help us understand where the anger is coming from. And I found this as a framework that we don't use often, but that is actually exceptionally helpful. And usually it's a nice potent mix of all four. However, the Buddha didn't recommend giving up all four right off the bat. On a broader level, the path he spoke about was using these bases of attachment, of clinging, for the sake of the path. So the one exception is kama upadana, attachment or clinging to sensuality. The Buddha was clear that this base has no place on the path. And kama upadana, it's clinging to sensuality. It's not an, a blanket statement that sensual pleasures, watching the occasional movie, 
going to dinner with friends, uh, that these are unequivocally bad things. And honestly, people can get wound up in knots trying to perform triage and cut off all those things that they've uh, fed themselves with in terms of entertainment or sensual pleasure when they step on this path. And often that leads to uh, a difficult and violent orientation towards practice. So be gentle. It's okay to watch a movie now and again. It's okay to listen to music. It's fine. But as we move on the path, there is a place where these things begin to feel coarse and distracting. And you find that the music that formerly felt so enlivening now echoes in your head for five days after you've heard it when you try to meditate. Um, I remember after being a monk for about three or four years and not hearing any music, um, whenever you heard music, it, you know, it really kind of sticks with you. And I got lucky enough where the monastery I was at in Australia, my fourth year as a monk, some construction workers were working on it. And they just had the stereo going of 80s hair metal, like for, for weeks. And after three or four years of giving up one of my favorite things, which was music, what I got was 80s hair metal. And honestly, it was actually, you know, you sort of appreciated it after that long. But it did stick around in my meditation, and it did feel coarse. And you find that there's a silent uh, refinement that isn't dependent on external stimulus that you begin to tap into more and more. And once again, this doesn't have to be a violent cutting off of these things, but more just you'll notice that your palate becomes more refined in every sense of the things you take in, the experiences you seek, the friends you pursue. And in the end, um, really Kama Upadana is about us fantasizing about sensual things, indulging in the fantasies and the memories. And I think we've all had meditations where you can really think about eating a pizza for about three days if you want, say if on a meditation retreat, and then the pizza happens, and it's about five minutes. And we can spend our whole lives in that way, and it just feels trivial. So it's really worth, when that movie begins playing in your head again, asking yourself, would I pay to see this movie again? You know, I've sat here before. And can you walk out of the movie theater? Metaphorically and literally, in this case, probably. So Kama Upadana, this exaggeration and uh, fantasizing about sensual pleasures, getting drunk on them, this doesn't have a place on the path. What does have a place are the latter three. So ditti upadana, attachment to views. This is something where we give up wrong view and take up right view. We consciously accept as a working model, that uh, view of the world, of ourselves, and of practice that the Buddha put forward. So, understanding, essentially, and this is perhaps one of the most fundamental tenets of the Buddhist view that we take on, kama, and the idea that what we give to the world will come back to haunt or to bless us. And there is a uh, idea that really we can navigate this world very simply by, without such views um, as Kama, and perform and live very good lives just on a basic conception of what's good, what's bad. We have an intuitive sense. And this is true to a large extent. But Having a view of kama also helps refine things at a different level. Sometimes it's really hard to give up the big apple. Ajahn Shah would say, look, sometimes you have a little apple and you have a small apple and you have a friend. And you want to give an apple to the friend, but you kind of want to give the small apple. And what you have to do is say, no, give the big apple. And 
one thing that helps honestly is the Buddha said that the reason out of the reasons to give the idea that this will come back to me in the future is the lowest of the reasons to give higher than that is looking at giving as just a good act in and of itself as looking at it as an ornament of the mind. But there are times where to get yourself to give, you need to use every tool available. And sometimes it helps to recollect that in some sense, that big apple might come back to you in some way, shape or form. Uh, even just in that, when you display that sort of generosity in the heart, people notice and they respond with a beauty. So this is a worldview uh, of the Buddha, which really helps. Similarly, it's quite easy to justify the occasional white lie or something like that. But if you have a view of karma, that every act that breaks the five precepts, where we lie, where we steal, where we kill, even a mosquito, that there's a particular scarring of the heart that doesn't just evaporate. This makes us more careful, and that is a good thing. So we can get by most of the time without adopting a very strong worldview um, in this sense, and getting into rebirth and other realms, that's a whole nother level. Um, and it can be very useful at some point in the practice, but this basic view of karma in this life is deeply, deeply important because it's the whole ground of our practice. If we can't instantiate new patterning in our minds and hearts, then what are we practicing for? But the Buddha was clear that we can. This is karma. So this is the adoption of a worldview which is beautiful and conducive to the path. So we give up these other worldviews and take on one that incorporates kama and the concept of transcendence and awakening as the highest purpose for a life rather than this or that goal held up by society that ennobles a life and makes it worthwhile and worthy of death. The second base of clinging the Buddha recommended taking on was sila pata paramasa, so attachment to rites and rituals. And often, sorry, he, he advised abandoning unwholesome forms of this, but using it in a wholesome way along the path. So a broad translation of this is methods and practices is used by Tanisaro Bhikkhu. And this is the path of practice. So it's taking on the Eightfold Path. It's learning and rejoicing in and basically sustaining ourselves through the joy that comes from giving, from faith, from the practice, from samadhi, from sila, from morality, from the Noble Eightfold Path, from the suttas. This is attachments to methods and practices, which is wholesome. And often people come into a context like a monastery and they see people bowing and wearing strange clothes with weird hairdos, and they just think this is absurd. And then the blind spot is that we don't realize we always and also all already live in an entire very intricate structure of ritual. We just don't see it because that's the water we swim in. So what we wear very much signals our political views, our desires, our choices. We, we're signaling to people all the time. When you go to a concert, what's more ritualistic than that? A sports game, um, how we navigate relationship, what's okay to uh, speak about how you approach certain things. All of these are methods and practice. And what we're doing on the Buddhist path is exchanging, not that these are unwholesome always or that they have to be given up. When we practice, we maintain, you know, a lot of these ways of interacting, but we're submitting ourselves to a higher order patterning, a higher order practice. And one very concrete way you can see this is when the ultimate goal of a life is complete purification of the heart, then every other situation that manifests in a life 
can be used in the service of that. This is what higher order practice means. If a job is just for the sake of accumulating some assets so that we can live a comfortable life, this is a method and practice developed and aimed towards that which is unworthy. But if we have a concept that this job and performing it beautifully and well and as a gift mindfully for the sake of our practice is one stepping stone on a higher order practice of the path, then it becomes a tool for that sake or for the sake of that larger and broader goal. There are two terms in Buddhism, uh, tanha, which means thirst, and chanda, which means zeal or uh, sort of wholesome desire. There are words with the word chanda in it that are unwholesome too, but mainly it's used in the sense of dhamma chanda, um, zeal in dharma practice, whereas tanha, thirst, craving, is used in the sense of consuming, uh, of feeding off of in an unwholesome way and as a cause of suffering. So in some ways, tanha, this thirsting that never really abates, maps well onto kama upadana, that first base of clinging, where we're always feeding off of sights, sounds, tastes, touches, hoping for fulfillment, and it never comes. Whereas chanda, the zeal of doing, this joyful effort, this is much more associated with the latter three bases of views, of method and practice, and of a wholesome sense of self-view. So with method and practice, there's a real joy in living a life you know is worthy, in doing and using your energy in, a goal, in the service of a goal you know is worthwhile. And that's fulfilling. That's chanda. And where he's tanha, thirst, and attachment to sensuality feeds the serotonin system largely, which is the system in our bodies which deals with consumption, with satiation. It's shallow, and it is always wanting more. The uh, attachment to or use of methods and practices of giving oneself to the path and of chanda, of zeal, deals with the dopamine system, of, uh, which is the chemical and neurotransmitter much more associated with uh, a sense of purpose, of motivation, of doing, of giving. This is what we aim for. We can't just step out of the need to interact with the world or have an orientation to it. But what we're doing is we're exchanging an ethic of seeking satiation for one of seeking to give and to embark in joyful effort. And I've used this quote before, but there's a, a really wonderful one by Gurdjieff that says, I dreamt that life was a joy. I woke and found that life was a duty. I acted, and behold, duty was a joy. So with methods and practice, this is the goal. We exchange unwholesome or unworthy concepts of how we live our life and where we pour our effort. And we take on for a time, for as long as we practice, for as long as we haven't attained awakening, a method and practice of the path and of Dhamma. And the final base of clinging, of upadana, is self-view. And there's often an idea that we give up a sense of self right when we embark on the path. But this isn't the case. What we do is we refine and replace an unwholesome sense of self for one which is deeply wholesome. So this is where we, uh, Ajahn Mahabua, a famous teacher in Thailand, said that the first two aspects of the path morality and concentration, we think in terms of self to cultivate. When we're thinking in terms of morality 
and we're about to do something we know is not worthy. We think, we have a sense that it's below us. We have a sense that we're not the type of person that would do this. That's a wholesome sense of self, and we work and cling to that in a sense. That's not the moment to say, you know, there's no self, what does it matter? That's a time to use the concept of self wholesomely. And same with concentration. When we're cultivating samadhi, we learn how to control and calm the mind. And this is basically learning to be beings and agents that have some measure of taming of our own minds and have a measure of control over it. That's also using the concept of self. Then when Ajahn Mahabhuya said that when we think in terms of wisdom, the third and final aspect of the path, that's when we use the concept of not-self, to see through everything as a vortex of causes and conditions. And that which is beyond all those is beyond concept and words. It's nibbana. So if we're going to adopt a concept of self, this base of clinging, the fourth, or the fourth one of atta upadana, what we want to ask ourselves is what would an enlightened being do here? If we're going to take on a sense of self, that's the one, as Bhante Sudhasa said. What would a Buddha do? And uh, Ajahn Kovilo and I have an acronym now we use, which was uh, WWLPPD. What would Long Parpasano do? <laughs> and so, if you ask that in your head and just imagine him kind of floating there, like you usually have an answer pretty fast with some reliability. And over time, whatever that sense of self that forms out of the path, that brightness of heart, that crystallizes, as it solidifies, it becomes more and more resonant with something, with reality, and with the goodness that flows around us, and people sense it. And it becomes imbued into the body to the sense that, to the point that, when you contemplate breaking sila, morality, you feel it as a wound, a tearing of nail through cloth. And when you do what is trivial, when you do something you know that is wasting your time, you feel it as a stab in the chest. And then when you're walking straight with clear footsteps towards a goal you know is worthy, you feel strong and integrated. And once the mind is ennobled through taking on that view, there comes a point where it leaps to that which is beyond. So we use these latter three as a raft to get to the other side. And often when people hear that raft analogy, they think of sort of a Tom Sawyer raft, really like well put together with a little hut on top. Um, but what the Buddha said was you gather sticks and branches and twigs and you just tie it together and your feet are hanging off the front of the back and your hands are sticking out the front and you're just floating. Because that's all we got. Most of us don't have big, nice logs on this side of samsara. We have a bunch of twigs and sticks and neuroses and imperfect relationships and careers that are kind of good enough but kind of not good enough. And that's what we have, and that's enough. We circle it together, or we tie it together, and we make a go of it. And Ajahn Mahabua said that as well, that this path isn't a sort of staircase up a mountain. It's like you're climbing up this cliff and grabbing onto clumps of grass here and there. And if it ever feels like you're always on the verge of falling, you're not alone. We're all there. And then when you get to the other side, all of those bases of clinging can be relinquished. There is a, uh, who here knows Banksy? He's a very famous graffiti ar artist in yeah, England. Um, so he did a, he's gotten quite famous and they sold one of his paintings in an art museum in England, I think. And there's a huge bidding war. And as soon as the final bid went up, the frame, there's a shredder hidden in it. So the whole thing just got shredded immediately. And I think it ended up selling for even more after that. 
But this path is a little bit like that. We pour ourselves into this frame, into these bases of clinging wholesomely, except for the first of attachment to sensuality. And then at the end, the frame shreds the paper and we're left with something far, far greater. So I wish you all the best bidding. We have time for discussions and questions. Um, those on the live stream or Zoom, feel free to type in anything you'd like to speak about. And those in the audience, if you want to raise a hand, we can have a mic runner come over to you and just say your name, if you would, before you ask a question so we know who you are. Hi, my name is John, and uh, I had a question about uh, the degree to which we pursue the Dhamma uh, in terms of the law of diminishing returns. Uh, where do you draw the line exactly in terms of, uh, or, or can it be overdone? I suppose, I mean, the obvious extreme, if you're neglecting your responsibilities and uh, end up in financial ruin, which, well, the financial part may or may not be a good thing, I don't know, uh, to let that go, but depending, but, uh, or even just, uh, not even that serious, but uh, just how you pursue the Dhamma in terms of, like, if you're just meditating all day and, and reading uh, Dhamma talks and, and whatnot, um, maybe studying too many varieties of things instead of focusing on, on maybe a specific text or, you know, can, can it be overdone or how do you, where do you draw the line, I guess is the question. It can be overdone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a real dilemma because you come in contact with the Dhamma and it is the most profound thing you've ever touched. You know, you fall in love. But uh, I think most of us have been through love and really just smothered the other person and it doesn't end well, does it? Um, it's also worth recollecting that the Dhamma's unbelievably potent medicine. And often we just try to take that whole bottle of aspirin and just down it in a gulp. So imagining kind of you're taking a few pills at a day, it's a vitamin, and you need a decent spoonful of sugar. So I'd say that the overdoing it, I would say it's impossible to overdo the path itself of practice. What is an issue is when we become fixated on one part of the path to the exclusion of the others. And this is a real danger because so much of the Theravada and what people are interested in and encounter on in their initial stages of Buddhism in the West is the focus on practice, on renunciation. And it can be like mixing acid with acid when you take kind of an isolated um, love-starved, modern, and mix them with that teaching. So often people, you know, their practice isn't going as well as they'd like, so they double down on the ascetic part. They meditate more hours a day. They cut back more from this or that. And there's a real sense of, when you start to sense dukkha, suffering, like it's always important to be applying this Four Noble Truth framework of like seeing suffering. So when you sense that sense of 
violence towards yourself of like cutting something off where maybe it shouldn't be cut off. That's something to really keep an eye on. Um, a good metric, uh, and I think I, I've said this before, is the, the words uh, gentleness, normalcy, and flourishing, and warmth. Those are good metrics for your practice. So understand that, say, of all the paramitas, the spiritual perfections, the first one ha is dana, is giving. And it's such a powerful foundation for practice. Um, so instead of like conceptualizing practice as just meditating as many hours as you can on the cushion, this concept of just like as still as long as you can, I think a grace of movement is a much better thing to think about. Um, so incorporating a lot of things into your practice, including uh, giving, including service to others, including ritual, including study, including art, um, the whole life can be a practice. And how you know if it's practice or not is if you're mindful, if you're able to keep right attention on it, if you're able to stay aware of your body, and if there's a sense of the mind growing brighter and brighter. And I, I think it's very helpful to think of our practice as a tiered system. So at the bottom, you have very robust, a very robust level, which you, you will need to use for a lot of your life, which is uh, very good when the mind's active and has energy. So maybe that's when you go out and you do some work. You, you know, work at a soup kitchen, you give to the sangha, you do something like that. Then you have a more refined level where it's, say, it's study um, and or reading or memorizing suttas or chanting. Then you have a more refined level, which is walking meditation or doing qigong. Uh, then a more refined level, which is mantra practice, you know, a me meditation object that you can use while you walk or sit or work, but that is like very robust. And a mantra, like a meditation word, is quite a good handle. And then you have a more refined object, which is, say, the sound of silence or the breath, sort of much more subtle without this verbalization. And then you have just the still point of the breath. And if all those levels are in your practice, then you can really work with your whole life as part of that. And you'll find certain parts of the day where you want to just meditate. And then other times you'll try to sit down and your mind will be a mess. And then you don't have to think you've failed. You just go down to progressively more robust levels until you find one that is calming and good. So maybe you can't walk, but actually going out and going for a run and doing some Qigong, that feels pretty good. And then doing some study and then meditating. So, um, yeah, and then just making people tie themselves up into such knots trying to be good practitioners. Like, really try to be normal. Like, society has some structures and routines in place because they're good for us. So, like, a sort of regular job, a decent social life, um, you know, some interaction with wholesome people. Those are just good grounding things, I'd say. So... So sort of as an updated image for the raft, I was thinking of a young child with floaties on and sort of floating in the middle of the pool, which for me sure is what it feels like quite often. I'm not necessarily trying to get anywhere. I'm just trying to keep from going under. And I have two questions, dealer's choices too, of which you choose to speak about, but I was watching the Abayagiri Uposta observance last night and the venerable giving the Dhamma talk was talking about how during Vasa, uh, they each had the opportunity to spend a couple of weeks in isolation focusing on their practice. And I'm curious as to how one goes about doing something like that without running into severe psychological issues because like that sounds very much like in prison of when they would stick someone in an isolation cell and you know you can't see your face in front of your your hand in front of your face and people tend to develop all sorts of psychoses and quote unquote fun things. And I'm also curious to hear your thoughts on the parami.
periods of concentrated retreat can be helpful, especially if done in a group context. Who here has tried Goinka, 10-day Vipassana retreats? Okay, well, you can find them. They're around. They're, they're pretty intense. It's like many hours of sitting a day, but people who learn to meditate that way, it's like they come out of it with a pretty strong practice and you know, you're held by the group, there's Dharma talks, so it's it's fairly grounding. Um, doing that on your own is harder. And generally, monks aren't allowed to really go off and go on their own until they've lived in community. Despite, it's pretty common, like new monks really want to go off, but when they do, they, they go pretty crazy pretty fast. So, you know, the ideal is learn to live in community a little bit. Um, and then going off on your own, there, there does come a time where it can be helpful. Um, so honestly, I recommend like those some of those retreats, like a cloud mountain and stuff, where you have a group there with you, where you're hearing talks. That can be very wholesome. Um, but as to people sort of doing going off on their own into a little hut or something, or you know, I just uh, I, I think it's much a much better use of time to go to one of those held retreats or to go to a monastery where you'll be held in the routine of the monastery. And that is very cl cleansing. Um, when one does go off on retreat on one's own, often it's good to have a little something you can work on in the background, like Tenzin Palma, who spent 10 years in a cave. You know, she did calligraphy. Many monks I know, you know, do do a bit of art. Um, so that can be helpful. But I'd say one has to be cautious. Yeah. And Generally, I'd say steering towards communi communal situations or communal retreats is, is a better bet. All right, so question from the live stream. A couple quick questions. Uh, first of all, where did you stay when you were in Australia? So asked. Melbourne. Uh, at Bodhiwana, Ajahn Kalyanos, and then at a monastery outside of Sydney called Bodhisattva, and I visited Brisbane as well at Dhammagiri with Ajahn Dhammasiha. And I also wandered Tudong through Wollongong for like a week, uh, which was pretty interesting. Thanks. Okay. And then also, um, is attachment to all things essentially just attachment to the lack of dukkha? So to lose attachments, should we learn to accept dukkha and lose aversion to suffering? And then also a follow-up. Whoa, whoa. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. All right, what's the follow-up? <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. No, 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 you, what is it? Uh, I'll try to keep it in mind. Um, and, and then how can we do that when humans are biologically programmed to move away from suffering for survival? Just quickly, I don't know why this came to mind, but in Australia, the best comment we ever got on alms round was this tradey driving by being like, no sandals, even Jesus wore sandals. <laughs> it's not related to the question. <laughs> the bases of clinging aren't necessarily attachment to lack of suffering. In some ways, they're attachment to suffering itself. Ajahn Jeff says that the last thing you can take from people is their suffering. And because we orient ourselves by our suffering, it's something very concrete to cling to. And if someone's ever tried to move away from an addiction or an unwholesome habit, even though you know it burns you, but it's familiar, this is an issue. And you can see it very clearly when you have a good meditation and things are bright you know the next day, you know it's going to be terrible because the self will start to, to sort of flail around and search for something to hold to. And so in a sense, it's what we know, but what the Four Noble Truths are in the sense of Comprehending suffering, letting go of its cause, which is craving, realizing peace, and walking towards that peace or developing the path. It's a learned skill of really evaluating the suffering and happiness that comes from any given 
moment of attachment or experience. So it takes a long time to train the mind to see clearly. And often an issue is that we don't have a reference point for what it's like to be outside of that suffering. So a lot of the path is learning to see Psychology says that we're good at giving up things when we see that they cause more suffering than happiness. The issue is that we're very bad at evaluating that. Um, so what we do is, is with meditation, with mindfulness, you get to see the full course of any experience. You see the drunkenness, but then you also see the hangover. And you really begin to feel the hangover. And oftentimes we gloss it over by getting drunk again or doing something else. So we're seeing the endings more and more and, and really taking that in. And we're getting a feel for the third noble truth of what lies beyond that whole treadmill and touching into that. And once we have that reference point, then we're able to give, give up or refine those bases of clinging. As to being animals that run, and there's two sorts of suffering. There's the suffering inherent in existence and its brokenness, in its changeability, then there's the suffering, and that, that it will exist no matter what. Then there's the suffering of the Four Noble Truths, which is the suffering we add on to it by clinging, by craving, by buying into things, by becoming drunk on experience. That's the suffering we give up. And as to being creatures that run from suffering, that's the case most of the time but most positive emotion in a life is gained from making progress towards a meaningful goal, the dopamine system. And when we conceptualize as this whole life as a practice of moving towards what is the most worthy goal of all, which is enlightenment, then we're able to be with and comprehend and be patient with the sort of low-level suffering of life, of its natural breakup and dissolution because we know that we're moving towards something far worthy. In the words of Nietzsche, with the right why, we can bear any how. I said that in a talk to a bunch of monks in Chiang Mai, and the translator translated it as, with the right wine, we can bear any how. And everyone was like very confused. <laughs> confused. So yeah, I'd say that there's a fa famous teacher named uh, Hanshan from uh, early, like 800 years ago in Japan. And he said, this path becomes all pleasure because when things are good and pleasurable, it's pleasant. And when things are hard, that gives you a chance to use your Dharma strength, which is pleasant. So it's all pleasant. I think that's what we have time for. <laughs>